Hello, listeners, and welcome to Clio's first ever Zoom author interview. I'm Brittany Fisher, this year's poetry coordinator for Penn State's Creative Online Journal, and I'm excited today to welcome Penn State's 2021 to 2022 Poet Laureate, Shara McCallum. Author of six dynamic books of poetry, including her recently released historical fiction, No Ruined Stone, which imagines the life of Robert Burns as if he had come over on the slave ship um, in 1786. She truly is an accomplished artist. Claiming poems and essays that have gained accolades like Through a, a Glass Darkly, which received the 2020 Oren Robert Perry Book Award for nonfiction. Her works have appeared in journals, anthologies, and translation throughout the globe. A faculty member of English at the Penn State University, as well as the Pacific Low Residency MLA, MFA. She is joining me today to share some insights into the life of the, po of the poet laureate and the learnings of a career creator. Welcome, Shara. Thanks, Brittany. So first off, tell us, Shara, what exactly does a poet laureate do? So um, a poet laureate is actually not the nominative that Penn State gives, though everyone has been calling it that, so it's fine. I am a poet and I am the Penn State laureate, um, but it is actually a position that is for any faculty member in the arts and humanities. One is chosen each year across all of the Penn State Commonwealth campuses, um, and that person is chosen based on the body of work they've contributed to their discipline to represent that sort of honorific, but I more envision it as a service role. So what I've been doing, and I mean, all of the laureates have a service component. I have been um, engaging in a lot of outreach um, across the Commonwealth campuses, as well as in community settings. So for example, yesterday I was at Altoona High School all day and speaking and reading for various classes, meeting with students and faculty there. So um, that's one of the components of the position is for the past year, this academic year, um, I'm going and speaking about poetry and reading poems, talking about this. And um, the other part of what I've done is a radio show that I'm hosting that I proposed to WPSU, which is the local NPR affiliate. And it's a poetry show that comes on the radio once a week on Mondays, actually it airs twice on Mondays four minute segment where I introduce a poem by another Pennsylvania poet. So someone, not me, um, each week I'm introducing different Pennsylvania poets to readers and listeners. That's amazing. Um, so it sounds like part of your job is really engaging with the artistic communities around the Commonwealth. Um, what have exactly. these experiences like shown you um, about the importance of community within the arts? Well, I have always believed in it. Um, I, before I came to Penn State, I, I was director of a poetry center for many years, for 14 years. So I see first, I've seen firsthand my whole life, the impact that um, in terms of community, first and foremost, the campus community that I'm thinking about is students. So yes, there are faculty and staff who also are attending the events, absolutely. But the principal audience in my mind are students who don't necessarily know what a poetry really is or what a poet could be or look like. So I'm really attentive to that as the value of going into communities and speaking about poetry, but also being a poet and allowing people to see that there's like a human being in front of them doing this and that this is a living art. Um, it depends on which community. I just chose that because obviously you're a student here at UP and I've been speaking with your counterparts as well as the reading I did that you attended all over the different um, campuses, mostly in person, actually. Um, so that's been really rewarding. Um, I mean, we've just come off of, you know, a huge pandemic and obviously a lot of your work was pushed digitally, i.e. <laughs> us here today. But um, have you noticed a big difference in your interactions when you get to express all of these things about poetry when you get to do it in person um, opposed to one online? Right. So I think, you know, in the fall, I was lucky. Um, I, 
I was able to, there was a brief opening between Delta and Omicron. And so I was able to go and I actually went to 15 of the 20 campuses in person. So wow. there, yeah, the, there are 20 campuses I'm visiting this year. Um, it's only my home campus that we had to shift to a Zoom virtual event. So it's really just since January. And um, yesterday was my first laureate visit back in person for Altoona. So the rest of this month in April, I'll be doing a number of events at other Commonwealth campuses, but also in the local community. Um, I'm you know, reading and talking about poetry for the Nittany Writers Association you know, at the Slow Library next month. Um, there's a wonderful local community arts organization called Ridgeline Language Arts. That was virtual, but I, I delivered a workshop um, virtually. So I think it's been a mixture, though I've really tried to push toward the in-person when it's safe, and we've been you know, feeling good that we could do these kinds of events. Um, I think the difference is obviously, this is really wonderful that you and I have the ability to speak in this manner. But I think most of us still really value face-to-face -face interactions. And um, I can at least speak for myself and say that I really enjoy that exchange and that it's a bit more challenging to have that kind of an exchange on Zoom. Um, I've certainly done a lot of them for two years now, not just as the laureate, but as a writer who gives readings regularly. I've been doing readings on Zoom now and talks and interviews and recordings. For two years, so I think we've all gotten quite practiced at this. But my my, if I have my druthers, you know, I'd I'd rather be with people in person. So, like, especially when you're doing like your readings and um, you know, interviews, um, and what it might be, what do you think is like the element on Zoom that is harder to you know purvey to your audience when you're not in person? Well, for you know, example, you and I are speaking one on one. It's not such a loss in this sense, right? Because we can do a better job of seeing each other's cues. But I mean, some of the Zoom events that I've delivered, there's been over 100 people in the room. So much more difficult. People don't necessarily have cameras on. So I'm not really engaging in the same way. Um, you might say, if I'm speaking to an audience of 100, how could I do that? It's actually far easier. I can read body language really well. I can read facial expressions. So I can be a lot more attentive and responsive. Um, one of the things I've tried to do to combat that is, you know, um, engage with Q&A as much as I can. So that for me feels them like the audience isn't just passively sitting there because that's the danger of Zoom. I mean, there's a lot of advantages. Um, access, you know, um, it's, it's geographic access that I'm able to give events. Um, I've done many inter events internationally or people internationally have been able to attend. So there's no, there's, you know, there's no small way in which this is a great boon in that sense for allowing people for various reasons to be able to get more easily to events. But um, yeah, I do really love the engagement, the improvisation, the conversation, those things are easier in person still. Yeah, that's really great to hear your perspective. I mean, I know I work a lot, you know, Zoom you, we all work a lot on Zoom these days. So mm -hmm. there are definitely are pros and cons to both of them. Yeah. Um, but also in addition to your job as um, poet uh, laureate, you're also a seasoned professor of English at Penn State and multiple other universities. Um, how have you noticed, like, and even your readings, like, how have you noticed your interaction with students like impact your work if at all it's a really interesting question i mean i've been teaching i, I teach at penn state this is my full-time job um, but i have taught at a lot of other institutions before coming here um, and i do teach just part-time in a low residency mfa program so that's an occasional um, other setting in which i'm working with students um, and I'd say that each of those settings is different, but I mean, even going and visiting the high school I did yesterday, um, what I find engaging, I don't know if I could say it's about my own poetry, is that when I'm with students of any sort and I get to talk about poetry, it's a great reminder to me of how much this work is valuable 
And it's not somewhere that exists outside of those conversations where I'm reminded of that. We don't live in a culture in which poetry is in, its, in, a, in the form I'm writing. You know, we might use it as adjectival and say, this is poetic, or we may say this is a form of poetry, but poetry um, in, in the sense of the tradition of this written form and this oral form, it has no space in our culture in the United States. It's not a film that is readily distributed. It's not music that people listen to. Um, and so it's really with students that I have that, I guess, excitement and recognition that this is something that matters. And that's really the exchange that's valuable for me um, as a writer to be reminded of the importance of the art. I like how you like, um, compare it to a tradition because mm -hmm. poetry really is how you know the great old oracles used to go around and that's how history was told and mm -hmm. uh, word was spread in the in the old days so uh, what do you think or like where is an area in society like outside of your readings and stuff that you kind of do see poetics almost valued a little bit more than in like a day-to-day -day conversation? Well, I mean, I don't think it depends. Like poetics, of course, is the study of forms of poetry and ideas about poetry. But in terms of where I might think of things that are analogous to poetry having a life, um, probably songwriting and um, rap, hip hop. I'm thinking about cultural forms in the United States where people might begin to talk about some of the analogous things that poets are concerned with rhythm, um, you know, uh, rhyme, like things like that, that we don't really speak about in other contexts as readily, I think. Um, the mu music is probably the closest analog to it in a popular form where you might hear some conversations that would lead to discussions that a poet would be having about writing a poem as well. Um, well, you've been writing for like a really long time, obviously. <laughs> um, where do you kind of see from where you're standing the future of poetry going? Do you mm -hmm. feel like it will blend a little bit more with those analogs of music or, yeah? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think um, I'm not very much a prognosticator of these kinds of things, but what I do think is interesting, I suppose, is just um, that it has persisted for as long as it has, despite not being a form that, as a literary form, it's wholly underread. Um, and people don't buy poetry, don't buy books of poetry. I mean, somebody like Ruby Core, notwithstanding, who's really an anomaly and an outlier, um, or you know, people have become famous for something else and then people will read their poems, right? Um, there are thousands of books of poetry published each year in the United States, thousands, and very few readers for each of those books, right? So that suggests to me that somehow the art continues despite not having a commercial audience. Um, and I don't know what that will look like or what shapes that will take. The distribution of poetry digitally is easier than ever. So um, readings that you can see by poets can search anybody up on the internet and find on YouTube a reading by many, many poets. And I think that has helped to shape more of an interest from a younger generation who's entirely digital in your orientation, basically, uh, much less page bound, despite the fact that writers still are attached to books. Um, younger and younger people don't want to read books proper necessarily, meaning, you know, fewer and fewer want to hold the book in hand, in other words. Um, so I think there's different ways in which there'll be flux and change, but poetry has survived those for thousands of years. I mean, you referenced um, the, the oracle or the, the keepers of history. I mean, we're talking about across different cultures, um, the Bardic tradition, the Griot, West African, Bard, you know, uh, Northern European, these are early, early peoples we're talking about whose primary um, ways of communicating cultural values and history of a people were through oral um, storytellers who were poets. 
So some form of poetry, I believe, will always exist. Um, have you found yourself doing more digital writings? Um, I know you have um, some posted on various uh, literature magazines and such um, in order to kind of capture the wider audience uh, that's online now. I don't, I don't do that. Um, but, you know, I think when I mean digital means, I don't necessarily mean I write there. I mean that it's easier to disseminate, um, you know, work freely that way. Um, I don't know, for me, I'm not really a writer who's that interested in that realm, but there are some poets who really do capitalize on it in a more engaging way. So it's more sort of like a hybridity um, of text and visual image. So there are poets doing that. I meant mainly, as I said, access for people has increased. It's easy to find whatever you want, including a poem by someone um, digitally for free. And you don't necessarily have to then have the whole book. Um, yeah, I still write by pen and paper to start my poems and, you know, very old fashioned in that way. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, I think it's also very nice to have an activity that isn't digitally based. Um, so much of what Definitely the world is. <laughs> it's, it's really lovely for me not to always look at a screen. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's hard because um, I write as well. And sometimes it's like, oh, my iPad is so easy to take with me. But it's like, oh, so many screens all at once. Yeah. Um, but I'm also interested in the angle of as a woman in the literary field, um, how, what has your experience been like? Has it, have you seen any more challenges comparatively to maybe a ma male counterpart? So if I just isolate gender as opposed to also race, I'd say, you know, I mean, I'm a woman of color, so I'd say that, um, and an immigrant. So I'd say starting out, I would hear from a lot of um, white, American male editors, comments that I, I regarded as entirely dismissive, um, patronizing, um, definitely steeped in certain biases. I, I do think that the disparities persist, but I, I feel as if in my lifetime, I have seen some gains made um, in terms of publishing. It's complicated though, because the problem is also that um, publishing remains still a wholly, you know, inequitable enterprise in terms of the gatekeepers who's holding the keys. And what they often want to see from minority writers in particular is, um, is sometimes, you know, um, what they have preconceived notions about that experience looking like. And I find that a limitation. So while I've seen more access provided, I also resist the idea that I have to deliver a certain expected narrative as a woman, as a writer of color, any more than anyone else would, i.e. the default male white writer, not expected to write about one subject, for example. So it's, it's really, it's a, it's a vexed question that you're asking, and I don't know, we could spend the rest of this time talking. Gender specifically, I mean, yeah, the disparity absolutely persists. One of the things I saw early as a writer, you know, I've been, I was in my 20s when I began writing poetry and I met some really amazing male poets who I revered. Um, and it was clear within, and it still is to me, within five minutes of meeting them, if that, how they were looking at me. And that was not what I wanted um, out of the relationship, i.e. Um, they did not see me as a fellow writer, you know? <laughs> Um, and in some cases it was, you know, outright harassment. So I, I mean, that's just part of, unfortunately, the experience I think so, so many women have who are in professions where they're male dominated as most are, and you're just beset by the, um, the kind of constancy of sexism and other isms. <laughs> There Sorry, are, it's not a hopeful a thing. I mean, what I will say is I've seen gains, though. I've seen inroads, and I've certainly put myself in the position of trying to be one of those. For the younger writers I mentor, I try to work very hard to counter that, you know, 
um, who I encourage, the text that I present to all of my students. I've been spending my life as a teacher trying to counteract those kinds of disparities. But we're playing a long game and we're playing, I say it's a game. We are invested in something that is going to take many more lifetimes than mine to redress. We're talking about thousands of years of history in the case of gender and hundreds and hundreds in the case of something like racism. You know, maybe it's also as old as human experience in terms of when you look at the ways people have always been tribal in saying we are us and these others are them. But specifically in terms of racism in the United States, I'm thinking or in the Western hemisphere, hundreds of years. So it, those things cannot be undone by one person in one generation or even a, entire groups of people trying, but we are making strides. Yeah, um, and I noticed like you really have put emphasis um, in your work to write from the voice of marginalized experiences and highlight these um, extra challenges that one must face, um, you know, just depending on what body you're born in. Mm -hmm. Could you like have your experiences as a um, Jamaican and Venezuelan descendant like influence this desire? Yeah, I mean, of course, the answer is of course, because, you know, my mother is Venezuelan, I'm Jamaican, my father was Jamaican, right? So um, I carry those different ancestries in me that are immediate through my parents, um, and they've shaped who I am. So all writers are not born out of nothing. <laughs> None of us are born out of nothing and are absent from the vicissitudes of history and our makeup. I just don't see the world that way. So the answer is really very clear to me. Of course, I would be indelibly shaped by these social realities that are mine. And at the same time, how we know ourselves as individuals is, is a compilation of many different selves that we're amalgamating. Some of those are those social selves and they play profound roles in our idea of who we are. They, however, so do many other features. I have sisters who bear the same gen genetic history and upbringing. We're not the same people. We don't look at the world the same way. So I think that's one of the things that's hard sometimes for people to grapple with when they're dealing with work by minority writers or marginalized writers, I am not representative of something <laughs> um, any more than any white writer would be asked or any male writer would be asked to be representative of all people because I'm a combination of those forces as well as all of the vagaries that make up a human being and the individuality that goes into that. Both of those are true to me. Does that, I hope that makes sense what I'm trying to articulate because yeah, um, I'm deeply connected to writing out of certain experiences, but for example, I'm also a mother, you know, and that deeply impacts how I look at the world and the, the work I've made as well. You know, there are loads of roles that we have that we integrate, in other words. Yeah, it's, it's uh, <clears throat> impactful to me that you're talking about yourself almost as like a collection of all these different um, experiences that you've been through or, you know, labels that outside outsiders might try to put on you. And um, well, it's also when we're talking about writing, I mean, you're a writer as well. And many people say, you know, whoever's going to listen to this or I assume writers, right? So when I'm writing a poem or an essay, Brittany, and you can say, well, this is true for you too. It's only some part of Shara that's showing up, even if I'm drawing upon autobiographical experience. There's loads of me that I don't put in that poem or that essay. The, so there's no point at which all of us is ever um, distilled into language entirely. I don't believe that we can do that, or that is even what we desire to do as writers. Um, that would be like saying a painter you know, has to paint every single thing that interests them to look at. That's not true. Painters tend to fixate on certain subjects and paint them obsessively, right? Yeah. I think writers are not different. Um, you know, we have many, I have many experiences in the world I will never write about, in other words. Um, so you, you speak on this, like, 
desire for, you know, creating, what would you, if you, I know it's difficult, but if you had to summarize your kind of purpose for writing, what would that be? So we all have many purposes, I suppose. So I'll just say for right now, I think one of them is um, to make sense of past experiences, my own, those in my family, those in history that are fragmented, that are uh, experiences of rupture and that are often irreconcilable. So what I'm interested in as a writer is I'm drawn to those fissures in experience and in recorded experiences of the self or of peoples, nations, you know, personal and public histories, essentially. Um, I think that's one of my purposes is just to try to mind that. I think I'm also deeply interested in them because there's so many lies and omissions. And I really want to be as truthful as I can as a writer. You know, the things that I was told even as a person growing up before I thought I would be a writer in my family that people, other people don't want to talk about these things. I always want to know more and always want to go toward those things. And so, you know, so I think there's that kind of truth telling that feels like a drive for me and a completion or wrestling with things that feel incomplete. Um, and it's never going to be achieved, by the way. I'm aware of that. <laughs> never. It's an endless process. Um, it's, you know, um, because history is always being remade for one thing. Every single time we're telling it, we're remaking it. I can definitely see like the essence of closure or not closure, but just increased understanding you could get from, you know, reimagining history um, through the lens of someone today. And with that, like, I just want to speak about your book of, cause you know, you're talking about your whole purpose is looking at your own history and the history of, you know, where you, the society we live in. Mm -hmm. um, is that what, was was that part of your inspiration for your latest work? Well, absolutely. It's, you know, it's a book of poems that is structured as um, an alternate, as you said, it's, you know, historical fiction, it could be called a uh, speculative account of history. Um, and it's because I think um, all of the history that's in that book, it's hundreds of years in the past, is the history we continue to replay and live with today. So the history of the failed project of the Enlightenment, um, the history of slavery, um, rape, miscegenation, these subjects that are often absent from a fuller discussion of who we are and what has made us who we are, um, those are still with us, the, the impact of that, the resonance of it. So I suppose it's just not very separable for me time, time in the sense of when we're moving through the present, I hear the past at the same time. And that's what the book is really grappling with when I was suggesting that you know we write and history gets remade in each present it's because we need to understand the past to find ourselves in the present. And we're also not, dis we're not disconnected from those pasts. And so, yeah, I think it's a belief that I hold and it's a way of going through the world. Um, I know not everyone shares this, but I think that's what's driving this particular book and often is driving me. That's very powerful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just because um, this uh, this book was published in um, 2021. So have you found yourself kind of uh, being inspired by more historical things as you've been making your way around the Commonwealth, maybe learning more about different areas that you might not have known about before? I love to learn about the history of the places I'm visiting always. Um, but I don't feel, I mean, anything can change and I remain open to that. And I've lived in Pennsylvania for 18 years. I don't think I will ever be from here. I feel very much of this place now, but not from it. And I don't know what that says about me, but I feel more connected still to the places that I'm from and 
I think it's that I tend to be as a writer, very backward glancing. Um, and those are where I feel my unfinished business resides more. I feel much stronger attachment to those histories, um, familially, ancestrally. Um, but yeah, I did love, and I have loved learning about more places in Pennsylvania. As I said, I've lived here a long time, but there are so many towns here. It's just an unbelievable. I think every five people and every four miles decides it wants to be a township in Pennsylvania. I've now concluded <laughs> because there can't possibly be this many towns, you know? But it's like, wait, I've never been to this one too. Um, but it's lovely. And, As a um, new transplant to Pennsylvania, I could totally relate oh, to that. Where are you from? Where are you from? Um, I'm originally from central New Jersey and yeah. just moved to like the Bucks County area. So yeah. um, I believe, oh, I'm looking bad here. I can't say the Commonwealth campus that's, that's near there. It's like, it's not Altoona. Like Lehigh, I believe it's near there. Pennsylvania? Yeah. Hey, Philadelphia, you said? Yeah. Um, Abington, Brandywine. Abington, that, yeah, there we go. Abington, Brandywine, and Great Valley are all near Philadelphia. So I will visit those the end of this month, all three. And then the last campus I'll go to in early April is Altoona, where I was yesterday for visiting the high school, but I will go to the um, Commonwealth campus in April. Yeah, I, I mean, I know a lot about Pennsylvania history. I mean, my, both of my daughters are from here. They're born here. Um, my husband is not. He's an American from Boston. But, um, and, and, you know, he's really uh, generationally, only two generations from there. His family is actually... Um, Eastern European Jews from Ukraine, Russia, Poland area. And so I, I think to myself, it's my duty as my children are from here to learn something. But I would have thought that even if, they, if I didn't have children, I just think it's good to know where you live. It's good to be part of the communities that you're, you're in too. But in terms of my writing, I was really dis discerning your question as a writer and thinking why? Sometimes, I mean, I wrote a poem called Susquehanna that was very much about the Susquehanna River and the valley and the history of it. Um, it you know, allowed me to feel more deep connection to that place because I used to live in that valley. It's about an hour and 15 minutes from here where I used to be, but it's not my primary subject. Yeah. You know who's a really wonderful writer at Penn State who writes incredibly about um, Pennsylvania is Julia Kasdorf, Julia Spiker Kasdorf. So as far as like, I, and I have so many on this program that I, I really want to give a shout out to is the program, because that's really anyone who wants to know more about Pennsylvania through poetry. It's a, it's an anthology of poets I've basically put together in their poems. There will be altogether 46 when I'm finished with my final episode in mid-July. And it's a short introduction to each poet, to the poem I'm reading, and then the poem. So short commitment of time, but I really can't promote that enough because again, it's to me, the work of a laureate is not just the laurels that you receive. It's that you're here given, I've been given a platform to speak of something that's been important to me. And there are so many other poets who are doing this work that I want to bring attention to their voices as well. And just to clarify for our listeners, her podcast is called Poetry Moment. So if you want to go listen, that's how you can find it. On mm -hmm. um, WPSU, you have to add that in because otherwise there's one other poetry moment. It's also a radio show, but it's not here in PA. It's in, uh, I think it's Minnesota. I came up with the name before I realized this. So, you know, this is the, this is the reason that titles are not copyrightable, by the way. Oh, really? Many people have just out of the same, yeah, titles come to all, people all over the way, the place, you know, simultaneously, so. Um, all right, and then, I, like, on that, because <laughs> I find it's, I always toss and turn between, sometimes I start with the title, and then the poem comes, and then sometimes you start with, like, a line or two, and then the title comes after the breath of the work is finished. Um, like, could you speak a little bit about your process of creating? And it could be about this latest um, book or your past works of kind of, how do you get in the mindset to write? Or how, how could you inspire someone else if they're not sure how to start in their process? 
So I, of course, I love to talk about craft and racing. And one of the most obvious, but it bears saying, is you have to read to write. You have to read a lot in the genre you want to write in, too. And that's not because I think writing needs to be pinned down ultimately by genre. Some of my favorite books are uh, cross genre in the sense borrowing from other modes of writing. Um, but I do believe that there's the tradition of the art that you're practicing inside of. It's not just about you and what you have to say. It's thinking about being in conversation with so many other writers and what they are saying and what they have said. And poetry is especially daunting. You know, if you want to be a novelist, I mean, it's, it's you know, hard to write a novel, but novels are only, you know, it's a baby tradition. It's only about 150 years old, I think, as a wow. genre. Poetry, yeah, poetry is thousands of years old. So you're, you've got your work cut out for you if you're a poet. You have to start by, you know, just reading a lot, I think. Um, that's my best advice. And then from there, imitate and steal. So that's the principle to me. Imitate structures of language, be inspired and instructed constantly if you're writing, if you're reading as a writer, by what you're reading, which is a different way to read than reading for content, right? So sometimes people read and say, I read to be moved by something. And that's fair. And I can't always and separate out writers. <laughs> yeah, but I can't always separate out that I'm moved also by the form and by the, the, the feeling both, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's only form, but it is helpful to think about what is the structure of language here? Um, because you wouldn't expect to become a great, I don't know, violinist and never watch anyone play the violin, listen to anyone play the violin, just have feelings about wanting to play the violin, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think to myself, why is writing treated so strangely, you know? Um, learn by absorbing, learn by being receptive and open to as much different kinds of writing as you can absorb and, you know, what you want to do. I'll often say to students who want to write love poems, for example, which is really common, you know, <laughs> students want to write love poems, sure. Perfect subject. It's one of the most difficult to pull off, but great. I admire it, applaud it. I'll say, which, which love poems do you like? Love. They can't name a one. And I'm like, okay, so we all have been in love and we've had our heart broken. Yes, of course. That's a wonderful place to be inspired by. How are you going to have a clue as to what you might do if you don't go find yourself a love poem to love right now? Go find one or I'll give you some. You know, so that's my approach. Is, as a teacher is that we're inspired and instructed by loving the art that we want to practice and by participating in it and by reading it. And that's, that's the key. You can take workshops, I encourage students to do so. What a workshop will do is allow you to see how a more experienced practitioner uh, breaks it down for you. It'll show it to you faster. It absolutely cannot supplant reading. Yeah. Wow. What I'm curious about is because this is something I struggle with um, as mm -hmm. a writer myself is I feel as though sometimes after, you know, reading a breath, uh, a breath of somebody's work um, or just various poets, I find and you said like imitation is part of the learning. How Absolutely. do you how do you in um, I don't know keep your originality and your own voice within imitation of others that you may be absorbing or learning from? I would never think you should even worry about that. I, I, I'm always amazed, Brittany. I think it's a common experience that you're describing to me. Um, the point is, listen, you're not going to be able to run away from yourself. Trust me. Right. So what you really is, do, no matter where you go, there you are. There you are. Yes. So there's no moment at which you're going to somehow shrink your consciousness by doing this. OK, what you're doing is like akin to a dancer warming up at the bar and going through the particularity of the vocabulary, the movement vocabulary that a dancer has to learn in her body. Right. That's what you're doing by imitating language. It's never going to change the fact that you're going to hear, I'm going back to dance, right? You're going to hear rhythm. Your body is going to have an, a sort of a very specific response to that. 
right? And that's going to then combine with the movement vocabulary that you have now been training toward. And that intersection of your consciousness and your feeling about music and movement is going to intersect with that tradition of dance. And you will start to innovate within it anyway, right? So they don't, I say this because I think people readily understand it about dance, about music, right? But somehow with writing, there's this very acute worry that you're going to somehow lose your originality. And what I would say is that's actually part of the point, right? Imagine that part of it is to be, um, or, or to find more expressive capacity for your originality as a, in language, not to see it as, you know, getting rid of you, but almost in, enlarging your possibilities. Yeah. I hope that helps. I hope you feel inspired you, Brittany. No, I know. Yeah. And think about this really that all you're <laughs> gonna learn by do like a mad lib with somebody's poem. And what you're gonna learn is how syntax works, right? Yeah. And <laughs> this um photo in my mind of like you know as you learn more words it doesn't change what you want to say it gives you a better way to say it exactly exactly because all the feeling in the world and all the ideas are not what make writers successful you have to also be able to articulate them in language and the only way to know how to do that, I come back down on again and again, listening to people is helpful, right? The rhythms of speech, um, but, but reading what other writers have done, you admire, you know, you, and even sometimes reading that which you don't admire is very useful. Why is because you're beginning now to discern what your own aesthetic preferences are. It's hard to do that if you're not reading, right? To yeah. say, well, why would you do this instead of this? Yeah. So I just think it's always better to know things. <laughs> I think I come out of that basic belief. I think, you know, it's better to, yeah, to learn and to know things. And then you have more decisions you can make and more tools at your disposal. Yeah, I, it, it totally resonates with me what you're saying. And I hope it, your words are inspiring the listeners as like you're inspiring me right now because oh. totally oh, you're energizing me to go book out the library <laughs> right. i love it a little ending quip here um of if you had to give your like when you first started writing if you had to give your younger self um a little bit of advice what would it be oh my goodness you have great questions thank you and i think you are my younger self so i'm gonna say this to you be very very patient with yourself Brittany. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, writing, I've been writing. I'm going to be 50 this year. So I've been seriously thinking of myself as a writer for 30 years. Trying to be a writer for 30 years is how I think of it. I'm still trying. It's always trying. Always. I have more skill, more tools from reading and talking about it, but I'm still always trying. And sometimes I've been frustrated, especially when I was younger, about maybe not being able to do it right away or not seeing where I had a clearing in my life sometimes to get to the work that I really wanted to be doing. Just try to be patient and, you know, persist. And persist is the other P word here. Be patient, but don't do nothing. Don't be idle. Persist. Keep persist. writing. Or if you can't write, read. There's loads of periods where I'm not writing, but I'm reading, you know? I'm basically filling the tank. Um, so that's it. That's, it's, I say it like it's so simple, but be patient to yourself and just keep persisting. And that's, that's it, really. Nevertheless, she persisted. <laughs> I love it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for sharing all of your insights today with us, Shara. Um, if any listeners would like to learn more about her or her works, you can go to her website at um, http. I'll link it down below um, forward slash sharamccallum.com. 
and stay tuned for more author interviews from the Clio 2022 masthead at clio.psu.edu. Thank you all for listening and for the glory of those who create.